You know, I love a good shortcut on my keyboards and on my Mac, I consider myself a keyboard shortcut connoisseur. And as we know, this past month, we've seen the release of the Mega 65. And one of the features of the Mega 65 that makes this machine so much fun is that keyboard that mechanical keyboard. Now that's the mechanical fun around the keyboard, but what about the functionality of the keyboard using the Mega 65 with Basic 65? And just how do we use those keyboard shortcuts to make our lives easier, better, faster, smoother on a Mega 65? And while you might think that these keyboard shortcuts are unique to the Mega 65, there's a long history of Commodore keyboard shortcuts that span all the way back to the PET. Now, much of what I cover today, you can use not only on the Mega 65, but on the Commodore Plus 4 and the 128. Some of them will even work all the way back to the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. So kick back with your Mega 65, follow along as I look at the ways to master your Mega 65 keyboard in this edition of Retro Combs. Now before we begin, I must remind you again that you can support the blog and the channel. You can support me via my Buy Me A Coffee page at buymeacoffee.com slash retrocombs. And you can support me with a one-time activity or you can become a member. When you support me as a member, you get lots of fun extras that you can't get just by watching this video alone. If you like my videos and you'd like exclusive access to me via Discord channel, you can become a producer like these folks, or you can become an executive producer like these folks. All you need to do is support at the Commodore 128 or the Mega 65 levels. Hey, and while I'm talking about executive producers, I have to welcome my newest executive producer, MindRail. Hey, welcome MindRail. Thanks for supporting the channel and becoming an executive producer. And thanks for your feedback already in the Discord channel. It's been fun to talk with you about new ideas for upcoming videos. Now we've got a lot of stuff to cover in this video. The good news for you is this video will have chapter markers down below so that you can quickly jump back and forth to the areas you have interest in, but also there is a lengthy companion blog post with tables and images and all the text you need to master your Mega 65 keyboard as well. I'll keep that page updated, so be sure and check back regularly under the video errata and see what I've added to make that post even better. Now, let's begin to learn how you can master your Mega 65 keyboard. So before we begin, let me set up the screen for you. And what you'll find is we have this image right here that's gonna be of me. I'll constantly be up here to guide you through your Mega 65 keyboard. Over here, we have the Mega 65 screen itself. And, and what's going on down here? Well, let's go ahead and turn this camera on right here and you will see that we have our view of the Mega 65 keyboard. Put them all together and you'll be able to follow along as we learn the Mega 65 keyboard shortcuts. Now I've gone ahead and I've just booted into the Mega 65. I basically just turned it on, but there's one command I want to show you before we get started, and that is the info command because it's useful for several things. Let me go ahead and pull that up now. And as you can see, this command will provide some basic information about our ROM, the speed we're running at, and then what's happening in the memory on our Mega 65. I share it, I won't be sharing a lot of commands, but I just share that one with you because it's a kind of a nice little tip that I've thrown in here just to get you started and to kind of share some of the things that we'll be talking about throughout this video. Now let's take a closer look at the Mega 65 keyboard. And I have to say I'm really excited because this is the first video where I've been able to use the actual Mega 65 keyboard on the production Mega 65. I've shared with you the dev kit in many other videos, but today I get to share with you this keyboard. Behold, the Mega 65 keyboard. Now I did cut it down to just the keyboard itself so that our disk drive over here isn't in the way and we can focus just on the keyboard. 
the layout of the keys on the Mega 65 keyboard are true to the layout found on the proposed Commodore 65 and therefore is a natural evolution of the keyboards around since the PET, the VIC-20, the C64, the Plus 4, and the 128. It includes popular keys in familiar locations found on these previous computers along with some additional functionality that we'll talk about in this video. Some of that functionality gives us access to both the Mega 65 hardware and software. Now, if this is the first time you're looking at a Mega 65 or even a Commodore keyboard, you're going to notice some things that don't look quite right. For instance, why is this here? Why is the open quotation above the two? That's not what we're used to. And what about this key? Where did that come from? Is that a cursor, up cursor key, arrow key? It is not an up cursor arrow key. Those are down here, but we'll talk about the functions of that key a little bit later. Hey, what about that familiar Commodore key? Well, that's down here and has been replaced by the mega key. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. You notice we do have function keys. Those look pretty similar, but you'll see it goes from F1 to F3. Where's F2? Well, I'll have to bounce this up here just a little bit and you can see that shift F1 is an F2 function key. Other keys that might not quite seem to be in the correct location include the at symbol and the asterisk symbol. There are other surprises that we'll talk about throughout this video. Now, if you're an old Commodore keyboarder, many of these keys will be familiar and your muscle memory will adjust. As a matter of fact, if you've been around the Commodore keyboard for it during the early 80s, you're easily going to be able to jump between this keyboard and a regular one. I occasionally find myself a little confused, but it's, it's not a stretch. And after just a, a few moments on the correct or whichever keyboard I'm on, I can get my fingers going where they need to go. If you're brand new to Commodore computers via the Mega 65, this is going to be a little frustrating, but hey, at least you have a wonderful keyboard to learn on. Now you'll notice the alphanumeric characters are all in the standard QWERTY format. So you should not be confused about the alphanumeric characters. Okay, we're gonna begin our journey by looking at the command keys found on the Mega 65. The ones we'll take a look at first include the return key, the shift key here and here, shift lock with a built-in LED that you'll see here. The caps lock up here also includes an LED. While they may seem similar, we'll learn that there are differences. The alt key found here, which traditionally on a modern PC is somewhere around here, but there is an alt key here. The control key found here. And finally, the escape key, which has functionality that is a little different than what we find on modern computers. Okay, let's get started with the return key. Now I'm going to steal some words from Jim Butterfield. Jim Butterfield in his Commodore C64 training video says, the return key tells the computer to, and I just love this, do it. But I'd like to talk about the next most important key on the keyboard, and that is over here, there's a key marked return. Now, what this key means is really do it. If I press that key, whatever I have just typed, the computer will try to do it. Okay. Do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. In other words, you type some text, you press return, and it means do it or do that thing that you just typed. Those things might include save a basic program line into memory activate an immediate mode command, display an incorrect syntax error message, accept program data input, accept program default data, or produce a simple carriage return. As an example, I could type print two plus two, and then I can hit return, which according again to Jim means do it. And you see that it displays four. That's an example of an immediate mode command. Let me give you another example. What if it's not an immediate mode command, but it is a basic command? Now what we do, if we hit return, it's going to do it, but it's not going to do it that it did previously in immediate mode. It's now going to enter that line of basic into memory. So let's do it with return. And how do we know that we've done it? Well, we can just type list. So there you go. That line of code is now in memory. Thanks to Jim Butterfield for making the return key so much fun. Who'd have thought? All right, let's go back to our keyboard because I want to point out that there are two shift keys on this keyboard, one on the left and one on the right. 
When used, these keystrokes are known as shifted codes. And while similar to their modern counterparts, they do have Mega 65 specific functions. For instance, you'll see the Y key here has two graphics characters on the front. Holding the shift key and tapping a key with two front graphics will produce the right graphic character. So in this case, that one right there. When the Mega 65 is in lowercase mode, holding shift and an alpha character displays the uppercase version of the character. Holding shift and a numeric symbol will produce the alternate character displayed on the key. Holding shift with a function key will activate the second function key. As an example here, holding shift, tapping F1 will produce an F2 function key. Okay, let's look at an example or two. So first off, let's do a shift Y that I shared with you earlier, and you'll see that we get the upper bar or vertical graphic character. Now, we won't spend a lot of time talking about all these characters. Let me just show you some more, but know that they are there and you can use them to draw tables or other characters. You'll see here's a Z, an X, a C, and a V. The Mega 65 includes a shift lock key with an embedded LED and a locking switch. You press shift lock when it is necessary to type many uppercase characters. While active, you no longer have to press the shift key to activate shifted characters. This includes graphic characters. If we want to take a look at that, you'll see now I am only typing the graphics characters. If I turn off shift lock, then I go back to the standard character set. Similar, but not the same as the shift lock, is the caps lock key. Again, we click it, it has a detent switch and an LED. This key is similar to shift lock and works with alpha keys to produce capital letters. Now this doesn't make much sense until we enter lowercase mode. If I hit my mega and shift and go back into lowercase mode, you're going to see some changes immediately to anything on the screen as you've already seen. Let me go through some characters here. If I hit one, two, three, four, five, you'll notice the numbers stay the same. If I hit A, S, D, F, you will notice that now they are in lowercase. If I hold shift, A, S, D, F, then we have uppercase. If I hit caps lock, You'll notice that I hit that and those stay on and then the one, two, three all display those characters. If I turn caps lock off and I hold shift lock, ASD will give me the capital letters, one, two, three, and four will give me those shifted characters. So again, that's that difference between shift lock and caps lock. It's also important to note that when we are in lowercase mode, we lose some of the graphics those little symbols that are on the front of the key. Some of those are no longer available. If I hit mega A, you'll see that I get the symbol, but if I hold shift A, I am not going to get the spade symbol anymore. I'm gonna get a capital A. If I hit mega shift, you'll see that my spade symbol comes back. So you're gonna lose those right graphics characters when you are in lowercase mode. Now here's a fun thing to know about the caps lock key. It has a superpower. So what is that superpower? If you press and hold the caps lock, it will force the processor to run at its maximum speed. This is handy when you need to speed up the operation of a basic program temporarily or speed load a program from a disk image. Let me give you an example of how this works. Now currently, we can find out what speed we're running using that info command that I shared earlier, and you see that we are at 40 megahertz. I'm going to change that. I'm going to type speed one. So there's a little tip for you that's not really a keyboard mastering tip, but it is a fun tip to have. And we're gonna change that speed to now one megahertz. You'll notice that the scrolling was just a little slower, and I'm going to pull up a directory listing, and you'll notice that goes pretty slowly. What if I want to speed that up? Well, what I can do is use the superpower of the caps lock key, type DIR, press enter, hold that, and you'll see it just scrolled instantaneous, just like that. So again, it's a temporary speed to turbo mode. I need the turbo Or 40 megahertz. 
The Alt key is a, another example of a modifier key that software developers use to add functionality to their software, but it does have some features for the Mega 65. For instance, if, if you press and hold Alt while booting, the Mega 65 will enter the Mega 65 configuration utility. It's important to note that on other Commodore computers, the Alt is not available. Let's go ahead and take a look at how we can use that. So I'm going to power off the Mega 65. I'm going to hold down the Alt and I'm going to power on the Mega 65. And you'll see that it pops up the Mega 65 hypervisor and we have three options. And I'm not going to cover these options because that's not the scope of this video. But know that you can configure the Mega 65 from here, you can format your SD card, and you can go into a keyboard test. That's pretty handy if we're going to become a Mega 65 keyboard master. Check that out. All right, we're back to our keyboard and we're going to now look at the control key. The control key is also a modifier key. These keystrokes are called control codes. Holding down the control while tapping a key will produce a result. The control key is a modifier key. These keystrokes are called control codes. What you do is you hold down the control key and you tap a key to produce that control code. Let's take a look at a couple of those now. Now I have a whole list of control codes on the companion blog post, so make sure and check that out. These are also in the Mega 65 book that you can download from the file host. Now the first thing we'll talk about is using the control key or the control code to change the color of the cursor on the screen. Right now you'll notice that it's white. If I hold control and I type one, you'll see that the color changes to black. Black is the very first character listed on the front of the key right here that shows black and orange. So how do I get that orange? Well, if you hold the mega key and tap the one, then you get the orange color. We're gonna focus on the control codes, not the mega codes for this section of the video. So control one, back to black, and I'll just go ahead and go through the colors. So that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Now the Mega 65 has more colors than that and we can switch to a different color palette or the Vic 4 color range by typing control A. So I'm gonna hit control A and you'll see now that the color has changed to cyan. Well, where did that come from? Well, we've got a whole new color palette now. Cyan is actually on number eight, but look what happens if we hit control one now. Before it was black. Now we have this color, and we're gonna talk about these colors in a little bit. Here's another unique color. So these are extended colors that aren't available, for instance, on the Commodore 64 or 128. If we wanna go back to the original color palette, we just simply hit Control D, and now we should get with Control one, black once again. Let's go ahead and change that to white to make it easy to see. Now I'm gonna go through these alphabetically from here. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to do that. Sometimes it makes sense to group these. Now you can find those by group in the Mega 65 book. For my video though, and my companion blog post, I'm just gonna go through them alphabetically. That way you have another resource that shows these control codes alphabetically if you're just curious, what does A, B, C, D, or do? But do know some of these are connected to each other and it may have been better to group them. We've done control A and control D, now we're going to come back to control B. If I hit control B and if we type, you'll notice that we are now in underline mode. Now, if you need to disable underline mode, which I do, there's an escape code for that. Not a control code, but an escape code. And for that, I'm going to hit escape and zero. Now, when I type retro combs, we're back to normal. We'll talk about escape codes a little bit later on. Let's say you are in a cyan mode for your text and you just wanna get back to white quickly. You could hit control two to go back to white or there is another one, control and E will take you back to a white cursor. So you can see now, I let me change this to green. You can see it on green. Control E will take you back to white. This is handy when, we're, when we are in that extended color palette 
because we've changed the colors of that top row of keys, the one, two, three, four, and five to the extended colors. So now we can quickly get back to white no matter which palette we're using. Hey, here's a fun one. Check this one out. We're ringing a bell. Control G rings a bell. We hit Control I. Now we start to move the cursor and this is taking the cursor and moving it to the next tab spot Control J will jump us down to the next line. Here, it's only jumping from line to line, each line. If you have a basic programming line that flows over into two rows, it will jump below that to the following line. Let me see if I can produce a quick garbage example for you. So there is a line of code right there, gobbledygook, and then I hit Control J, watch what happens you'll see it jumps down two lines, where normally it would just jump down the single line. Pretty handy. Now Control K locks upper and lowercase modes. So if I hit Control K and I start typing, change that to lowercase mode, you'll see I can't change upper or lowercase mode by hitting the mega and the shift, which we're gonna talk about how to do that later. Now Control L gives us lower and uppercase mode back. Now this is very strange. Control M is exactly the same thing as return. So if I type 20 print and hit Control M and list, you'll see that's the same thing as return. I don't know why, it's just there. But I'm sure somebody out there knows why Control M is the same as return. If you do, make sure and leave a comment down below now here's another interesting one, Control N. While it looks like it toggles between upper and lowercase mode, if I hit Control N again, it will not change it back. So Control N only changes from uppercase to lowercase mode. Let's hit Mega Shift and put that back. Control O sends us into flashing mode. Shades of 1990s internet websites, huh? Hitting Escape O, not Control O, Escape O disables the flashing. Not for the things behind it that you've already typed, but for everything going forward. Now Control P, watch what happens. If I hit Control P, it shifts down a line of basic code. No matter where you are, if I come up here and I hit Control P, it's going to list that basic line of code and it will just keep going down through the lines of code. It's very handy and we have another way to do that that we'll talk about when we get to function keys. And not really adding any additional functionality is control Q which again jumps down line by line. So we've not talked about it but there is the no scroll key which is right here. The no scroll key will stop a display from scrolling. For instance if I type directory and let's go ahead and change our speed back to one so that we can stop it and type directory and hit no scroll, that stops the scrolling. No scroll though will allow it to continue. If I type dir and then while it is listing hit control s, watch what happens. Very similar response, but look what happens when I hit control s again. It's not a toggle, it just stops it. Will no scroll turn it back on? Let's try. And we see that it does. Now I'm going to go ahead and list our program. I'm going to move up and I am going to move over and show you what control T does. If I hit control T, you'll notice it's the same as our insert delete key right here. Let's move over a little bit here. I'm going to hit control U and what you'll notice is it moves the cursor back one word. It's looking for patterns for words. Let me see if I can clean up line 10 for you and show you that. Okay, we have a new line 10. We're gonna go ahead and move this to the end of the line. Then we're gonna hit Control U. And now you can see it moving back a previous to the previous word. That one will be very handy. I showed you how to scroll down now let me show you how to scroll up your basic program codes one line at a time and that is control V. And you can see that here. Control P to scroll down. V, P, 
V P. Very, very handy. We've moved back a word. How do we move forward a word? Well, we can do that with Control W. Another handy, handy feature. We can use Control X to either create or clear tab stops. What do I mean by that? Let me go to tab right here. I'm going to hit tab and you'll notice it jumps over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters. Now, if I want to clear that tab stop, what I can do is hit Control X. Now I'm going to come back to the beginning and I'm going to hit tab again. And you'll notice it jumped to, I'm assuming, 16. Now if I want to set one, maybe I want to set one where I think they should be, which is 10. 9, 10. I'm going to hit Control X. That should set it. So we should be right in the space between the open quotations and the R. Now I hit tab and there we go. So Control X will clear or set tab stops for you. Now Control Z will move left a tab stop. So if you're going forward and you want to go back, you can hit Control Z. Now a lot of us are familiar with Shift Tab. Does Shift Tab also go backwards? Yes, it does. So Control Z is just another option for you. Okay, let's say your right cursor key isn't working for whatever reason. We're done, right? We can't do anything. Not quite true with our control codes. If we hit control plus close bracket, you'll see we can move right a character at a time. Now if we hit control and close bracket, you would think that that would go the opposite direction. It does not. This is the same as hitting escape. So we'll talk about escapes, escape codes later, but control open bracket is the same as an escape button press. If we hit control and the asterisk, that loads our matrix mode debugger. We'll talk about that later. I've talked a lot about the colors and how we can access them using the keyboard, using some keyboard combinations. Right now I want to show you what those colors are that are available. So I've created a simple basic program to display those colors. Let me load that up for you. By the way, if you want this program for yourself, there's an update to it on the file host on the Mega65 files.mega65.org site. See, even fun sound effects. So you see the colors here listed, black, white, red, cyan, purple, all the way down. The ones on the left are the standard co color palette that you would find, for instance, on a Commodore 64. The color palette you find on the right is part of the VIC-4 chip, and that's that extended color palette. And the community all rallied together to come up with fun names for those colors, since they're colors based on the original palette, but just a little bit different. By the way, there'll be an update to this program that will show you not only the color code, the 1 through 31, or the 0 through 31, but also the hex numbers. Be on the lookout for that in version 1.5 of this program. But you can see some of the fun colors over on the right. For instance, Guru Meditation, Rambutan, Carrot, Lemon Tart, all the way down to my personal favorite, Hot Tamales, which is number 31, which was my suggestion for the color. So this was fun. This was a two-day shoot yesterday while I was working on this video, right when I started to talk about the use of the Mega 65 key or the Mega key. We had a power outage and we've been without power for about 12 hours. So there's a little behind the scenes of a YouTuber trying to provide you content. Now, what I've done is I've gone back upstairs, I've grabbed my blue shirt, so you will, it will look like there's continuity, but now I've just blown the whole thing and you know there's not. But anyway, let's get back to using that mega key, using mega modes or mega codes on the Mega 65. That's a lot of mega-ing we need to get back to. Next thing we're going to do is talk about the Mega Key. Speaking of the Mega Key, does that shape seem familiar to you? Well, here is a little video that will explain why that looks familiar. That's pretty fun, isn't it? The Mega Symbol is actually a remnant of the Commodore logo. Pretty cool. You may not have known that. Now that you know where that symbol comes from, let's find out how to use it. The mega key is another modifier key. Holding the mega key and tapping a key that includes the two front graphics or a single graphic symbol will produce the left graphic or single symbol. Let me show you some examples. 
If I hold the mega key and hit A, you'll notice that we get the, the little, little part of a table or part of a window character. If we hit K, then we get the left symbol for that one. So again, the mega, holding down the mega here and tapping a key will give us the left character on the front of the keys. Now we've already used it, but we could also hit mega and the shift key tapping it, and that switches between uppercase and lowercase. And here on this screen, if you hit mega shift and you look at the color bar at the top of the screen, you can see how they get that little right slanted area at the end of each color bar. That's pretty cool. Now holding the mega key and tapping a number key with the color on the front of the keyboard or of the key produces that second color. So here you'll see that we get orange, we get brown, light red, dark gray, medium gray, light green, light blue, light gray. Hitting mega with number nine gives us the shifted nine character. Holding mega with the zero will of course give us zero because there's no character shifted. So depending on the key, you could get some results that are not expected. For instance, in the nine, you would not think that the mega and a nine would give you the closed parentheses, but it does in this case, which is the same as the shift nine. Now, one of my favorites is to use the mega code to load the matrix mode debugger. For this, I'm gonna to switch to full screen. If I hold the mega key and tap tab, it activates the matrix mode debugger. How cool is that? I think we all know now where the name matrix mode debugger comes from. Do you always look at it and code it? Well, you have to. Now we will not spend time talking about the features of the matrix mode debugger, but I do want to share one piece of useful information. If you look in the matrix mode debugger, you can see that it tells us which core we currently have loaded on the Mega 65. That's a pretty handy feature and a quick way for you to check the core installed in case you are wondering, you're asked questions from the developers or you need to share that information in the Discord community. To get out of the matrix mode, simply hit Mega and Tab again, and that will exit out. And now for this next one, I need to turn the Mega 65 off. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to hold the Mega key down, turn on the Mega 65 using the power switch, and you'll see that we automatically boot into C64 mode. Now, you can also hold the Mega button down, hit the reset button, and that will also boot into the C64 mode. To go back to the Mega 65 mode, either hit reset or power cycle the machine. And there we go, we're back into Mega 65 mode. And this music is really good on this demo. Let me exit out of this. Just a little tip, if you do exit out of the demo that comes with the Mega 65, one of the things you're gonna notice is that there is a program in here. That is the menu program. So if you're starting from there, remember to type new so that you clear that out. For this next one, I need to run a piece of software. So we're gonna reboot the Mega 65 back into the demo mode. Okay, and I'm gonna turn the sound down just a little bit for us. There we go, now it's way down. Now normally when a piece of software is running, we can hit the run stop key and that will stop the program as you can see here. We broke out of that menu, but listen. The music's still playing. By the way, if you do get in that situation, just type play with nothing at the end and that'll immediately stop the music. There's another little tip for you. So run stop has some other features. For instance, if we hold shift and tap the run stop, what that will do is load the very first program on the disk image, the default disk image or the disk image that's currently loaded, as you can see here. Now another cool feature is the hold to run stop key and tap reset on the side of the keyboard, which is over here. Watch what happens. 
Now we are in the monitor mode. If we wanted to start programming in machine language, we are ready to go. Now you can also enter that another way. So let me go ahead and hit X for exit. But if we just type monitor, look what happens. We're back in the monitor. So a couple of different ways that you can get into, mon into the machine language or assembly language monitor. Now, will it work with a power cycle? Let's try it. Let's hold our run stop. Let's turn on our power cycle. And once again, that works as well. So there is the use of the run stop key besides just stopping a basic program. Now let's talk about this restore key right here. The restore key has been around on several other Commodore computers and the feature that I'm going to show you first with restore will work on those computers. Once again, we have our demo running and we just used run stop earlier we're going to use run stop again in addition to using the restore key. Let me show you something first. If I just hit restore, you'll notice nothing happens. But if I tap my run stop, hold it down and hit restore, you'll notice that it clears the screen and goes back to a fresh state. However, if I do a list, look what happens. Everything is still in memory. But run stop and restore will clear the screen and give us a fresh state. If I type info, you'll see that we have our information on our computer, including our memory used. Right now we're at 37380. If we type new and then type our info, we can verify that there's nothing in memory. Let's go ahead and reload that program. And let's just keep it running while we talk about another feature of the restore key. So new to the Mega 65 is the freezer menu. The freezer menu is activated by pressing and holding the restore key for a few seconds like this. Now there's a lot going on in the freeze menu. We are not going to cover the freeze menu. That's a whole video in itself, but know that you do have some options in there like changing the CPU mode. You can swap your joystick by hitting J. You can change your CPU frequency. You can change the video from PAL to NTSC. You got some tools in there. There's that monitor again. If I type the monitor, that's gonna jump back into the monitor that we just looked at. There's also audio and volume that you can change if you'd like to do that and a built-in sprite editor that's pretty cool in itself. Again, that's probably a whole nother video by itself. But probably the most useful feature is using the freezer to save states. You can see here, I've changed and loaded a state where Pitfall Harry 2, I could load that just like that without even pulling up the disk image. It's just frozen at that state where I was playing the game. It's very handy. So the Mega 65 includes four cursor keys. You may remember that prior to the Commodore Plus 4, the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64 only included two cursor keys that combine both the vertical and the horizontal. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. The Plus 4, the C128, and now the Mega 65 include four directional cursor keys. Let's take a look at how to use those. So no surprise, down moves it down. Right moves it right, left moves it left, up moves it up. But as I mentioned, the Mega 65 team has left that shift functionality into the keys in case that's where your muscle memory is. So for instance, if we hold shift and left, watch what happens. It goes left. If we hold shift and right, look what happens. It goes left, okay? If we hold shift and down, you'll notice that we go up. If we hold shift and up, you'll notice we still go up. So the down and the right have been keyed for that shift functionality. So let's go down, shift, let's go up, let's go right, shift, let's go left. So again, if your Commodore muscle memory really needs that shift key and those two cursor keys as opposed to four, that is built in. Now, along with the cursor keys, you may be saying, hey, Stephen, I noticed this up arrow key here and this left arrow key over here. What's that about? Well, let's take a look at that. Let's go ahead and run, stop, restore and clean our screen up. So think of the up arrow as an exponent. For instance, if I print two raised to the second power and hit return or do it, thank you, Jim Butterfield, in immediate mode, then you'll see that we get the exponent of four. But what about the left arrow key over here. If I hit it, what happens? Well, it simply prints that character. 
just a leftover from the Commodore days. There evidently was a need to print a left arrow character, and I have no earthly idea why, which is why I'm reaching out to all of you. If you know why we needed that character on our Commodore computers, please leave a comment down below. All right, there is another use for this left arrow besides just printing a bunch of left arrows. Let me show you how it works. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to restore. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to activate my three and a half inch floppy that I have inserted into the Mega 65. And you can hear all that wonderful mechanical clicking. I'm gonna hit zero. I'm going to hit internal three and a half. I'm gonna hit F3 to load. And you'll see that our, with a directory command, our floppy disk is loaded. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to type a short program and we're going to use the obligatory retro combs scroll program. Let's do 20 and let's go to 10. So we have a good quick program and I want to save that to the disk. So instead of typing save or desave or any combination of that, I'm going to hit the left arrow and I'm going to call this RC scroll. Now you'll notice I'm not typing a close quotations because it's not necessary. So I've really showed you how to shorten some keystrokes to saving programs. We're gonna go ahead and hit return. And you'll notice it's saved. How do we know it's saved? Well, we can type directory. Well, how do we know what's on there is actually what we want? Well, we can type list and we can come over here and get rid of this and hit enter. And you'll see there's our program. So there's a couple of commands for you to share, not only can you list the program itself using the keyboard, you can actually list the file from the disk to make sure you have what you need. There you go. So there's the other use for the left arrow key. Now I've used the insert delete key several times already, but let me just go ahead and spend time talking about it. We know what delete does, it goes backwards. If we hit shift and then hit that key, that's going to move things in front. Let me go ahead and type some text here. And you'll notice we have some errors in here. So what I want to do is show you the use of the insert and delete key. So if we go to retro combs and we go to the C and we hit delete, we know that it goes backwards. So we can also do that with our today here to put those words together. But what if we want to insert something in here. Well, what we can do is hit shift, hit insert, and we can type what we need. That's also important to note that if I push insert delete and hold it, it's just going to keep on going. So be very careful with that. It also works for the inverse, which is shift and insert. We also have another key here called the clear home. If I hit clear home, you'll notice that the cursor moves to the home position. Anywhere that cursor is located, hitting clear home will move it to the home position in the upper left-hand cursor position. Now that's a lot different than this keystroke combination, which is the shift clear home. Watch what happens when I hold shift and tap clear home. That clears the screen. So if that's not what you intended, don't hold shift, just hit home. Now we've touched on no scroll a little bit earlier, but it stands to be repeated. Let me go ahead and hit list and hit no scroll and you'll see that will stop the scrolling of a long listing of a basic program. I can restart it by tapping it again. Stop, tap, start. So it's a toggle, you can see that. All right, we're getting to the end. We have two more things that we need to cover. We need to cover the function keys and the escape code. So let's get started on those last two items. So these are the function keys across the top. We've not talked about escape yet. That will be the last key that we talk about, but we have talked about alt, caps lock, and no scroll. But what do these function keys do? Well, they have functions just in basic mode, but remember these can all be programmed to be used by any software program. You'll notice it goes from F1 to F3. F2 is a shift F1. If you look on the front right here, it says F2. So a shift and tapping that key would be an F2. Likewise, F3, F4, F5, F6, F7, F8, F9, F10, 
F11, F12, 13, 14, and technically the help key is in fact a 15, 16. So now let's use them and find out what they do. And we're just gonna go through each and every one and see what happens. And so F1, F1 you'll notice what just happened there. Well, what just happened is if I do a DIR, put some characters on the screen and hit it again, you'll notice it changes from 40 to 60 column mode. That's one way to do that. There are a couple of ways to do that, but this is the quick way to do it by hitting F1. Let's do a shift F1, which is an F2. So I'm not gonna say the shift anymore. I will just say F3, F4, F5, F6. But we know that we need to hold shift to get F2. And you'll notice nothing happens. That's because for F2, there is no function. Now I have a table of all of these function codes and when we're coming up on escape codes in the companion blog post so that you can go to that page and you can print that or just have it handy. So let's look at F3. If we hit F3, which is very similar to the Commodore Plus 4, which is where I very first fell in love with the F3 command. Here it is. This pulls up our directory. It's very handy. Now, the other nice thing, look at that last line. You'll see that there is a sequential file down there at the bottom. If I hit F4, it only lists the program files on that directory in that disk. F5 is another handy way to move the cursor. F5 moves the cursor back one word. Now we've seen that with control codes, but you can also do it with the F5 function key. F6 is a bit of an anomaly in that it just does this. It tells us what key it is. That's, that's kind of interesting. Now that is important to note though, because you can program your function keys to do whatever you want so for instance, if I want key six to actually do something besides this, I can come up here, type a comma, open quotations, close quotations, hit enter, and you'll notice that it says ready. Now watch what happens when I hit F6. So that's how you can program your function keys in basic to do whatever you want. Now you need to remember, whenever you pile power cycle or reset your computer, that's gone. So you probably wanna embed that into a basic program if it's being used as part of a program or you just want to run a basic program that quickly assigns your function keys for you. So there's another little master tip for you in mastering your Mega 65 keyboard create those shortcuts using your function keys because many of the function keys options you're not going to use by default. When I hit F7, it looks like it jumps ahead just to, uh, in this particular example, one cursor spot. However, let me go back up here, now hit F7 and what you'll notice is it is jumping ahead one word at a time. Hey, remember the monitor, the machine language or assembly language monitor and all the different ways that we had that we could enter that? Well, there's another way with a function key. If I hit F8, you'll see it automatically enters the monitor command followed by return and puts us into monitor. Now this next one is worth the price of admission alone if you're a basic programmer. Check this out. I'm going to hit F9 on the keyboard and you'll notice that line 10 of the currently loaded basic program appears. Now watch what happens as I keep hitting F9. You see that we just continually scroll a single line at a time through the basic program. Now this is the menu program that comes on the onboarding SD card for the Mega 65. Now I'm going to do something I've not done, which is get ahead of myself. We're not gonna talk about F10 yet, we're gonna talk about F11, check this out. Hit F11, now we're going back up. Now notice, it scrolls back down. I can hold that, and we're scrolling up and down through our long extended basic program. This is simply for me just amazing and something I wished I'd had back on my VIC-20 and Commodore 128 when I was doing those extensive basic programming lines, sessions of code, whatever I'm going to call it. I mean, look at this, isn't this cool? I, it's, it's so fascinating, I could just sit here and do this all day long. But I won't because we need to talk about F10 and F12. So Stephen, you over there hitting the scroll up and down, get back to work. All right, well, I've just said to myself in my brain that I need to get back and show you the other two keys. So I'll stop doing this now. Let's talk about F10. 
if I hit F10, I'm going to need a clear line. So let me get out of here and hit a fresh line. I'm going to hit F10. You'll notice that we get key 10. Similar to key 6, this really doesn't do anything, but we could go ahead and program this for some functionality. Maybe it's just to list. And when I say list, what do I mean by that? Well, if I hit Shift F10, and now we can list our program. So again, that's a way that you can program your function key. Similar to F10, we'll hit F12, and you'll see we have the same thing. It is another function key that you can program. Now for F13 and 14, I'm going to scroll up. I'm going to move to the middle, to the Y, and I'm going to hit F13 and watch what happens. You'll notice that it deletes everything in front of the cursor. Guess what Shift F13 or F14 does? That's right, adds space, similar to the Insert key here. All right, I'll move down here to a fresh screen. We'll talk about our last function key, which is the Help key right here. If I type Help, this is what I get. I simply get the word Help. Now, it looks like it's trying to load some help. Currently, this is not implemented. Here's hope that maybe in a future ROM, if there's some space, that maybe help will lead us to something. And it could easily be a help file on your SD card image, or it could be developer uh, files on uh, maybe another disk image that's full of developer tools. There's a lot of ways we could use that. So that's F15 as well as just help. So shift would be F16, and that gives us exactly the same thing. So the help is keyed. F15 and F16 to the help command. And those are all of our function keys. Now we're on to our last round of keys, the escape code functions. Let's see what those do. Now escape functions are kind of weird. They're, they don't work like a shift key or a control key. What you do is you tap your escape key and then tap another one. So you don't hold the escape, you tap it and tap and that enters an escape code. There are a ton of them. Let's, let's, let's dig into them. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do is pull up a directory here. I just need some text on a screen. And what I'm going to do is we are going to work through, much like the control codes, the escape codes alphabetically. Now, again, some of these probably should have been grouped. Actually, some of them are grouped within the Mega 65 book by their function. Now I'm doing them alphabetically just so you have a variation of what's in the Mega 65 book. Again, there's a complete table of all of the escape codes alphabetically in the companion blog post, link in the video description below. So here's our first one. It uses the at symbol. The at symbol is here. So remember what I said, you're going to tap escape and then tap the next character. So you'll notice the, char the, the cursor is right here. And well, let's do this one right here. I'm gonna hit escape and the at symbol. And you'll notice it cleared everything from that cursor on. That's pretty handy to know and to use. While we're here, we may as well go to escape number four, and that switches to 40 column mode. Remember, we've seen that before. If we hit escape and eight, guess what that does? You guessed it, back to 80 column mode. Let's go ahead and get some text back up here again. And I'm gonna scroll up, and again, this isn't gonna make a lot of sense, but let's just try and do something right here. I'm going to hit Escape, and this is our first alpha character. I'm gonna hit Escape and A. Now again, it doesn't appear anything's happened, but watch what happens. Now I am in constant insert mode. That actually is much better than the insert key because it lets you just keep on typing and it automatically adds it. When I use this key, I kind of have to guess how many I'm gonna need and type in that many, but this way I can just type them in and keep going. Now, because it's so close, I am gonna break alphabetical mode here, and I am going to hit Escape and C, which cancels my auto insert. But let's go back to Escape B so we don't forget about it. Escape B is a bit odd. I'm going to go ahead and move the cursor down to right here and I'm going to hit Escape and B. Now, it doesn't look like anything's happened, so I'm gonna come back over here and I'm gonna type directory. And what you'll notice is that bottom right margin just changed. Notice how everything shifted? So now I've changed my right margin so that everything is within this area. Now I'm gonna clear that. I'm gonna go ahead and hit Run Stop Restore and that'll get me back to a fresh state. We'll learn about another escape code later that can help with that too. 
All right, going back to our escape codes in alphabetical order, let me put some text on the screen for us. I'm gonna pull up here to toxic characters and I'm going to hit escape and D. And you'll see that it erased that whole line and shifted everything up. Let me do that again so you can see that. Escape and D. Hey, does that flashing cursor bother you all the time? Escape codes are your key. All right, let's hit escape and E. And look, now our cursor no longer flashes. What's that? You don't like a non-flashing cursor? Got you covered. Let's hit escape and F to turn flashy back on. Hey, remember control G? Well, we can turn that off with an escape code. We can turn it off by hitting escape H. Now when I hit control G, I don't get anything, but let's back up a character and hit escape G, now control G, and our bell is back. So this one's very useful. I'm gonna hit escape and I for insert. It inserts a line below the cursor. Let me do that again. So this is very useful and comes in handy for escape, insert, but also remember we did escape and D and we could delete a line. So you can use those two together to be very effective in creating and removing space in or on your screen. I'm gonna go ahead and move my cursor over and I am going to hit escape J and that will just simply move us to the beginning of a line. Escape K does the opposite, removes, moves our cursor to the end of the line. Escape J, escape K, escape J, escape K. It's a lot like that uh, F9, F11, you can get carried away with this. This is a good, good one to remember. Now escape L and M deal with scrolling. So again, I'm gonna to have to reverse to show you the other. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to hit escape M. And then I'm going to pull up my directory. Now notice where the ready prompt is. It's right here. So what's happened is the Mega 65 has listed the directory to the bottom of the screen. So all the way down here and then jumped up back to the top to list the rest of it. It didn't scroll the screen and scroll the information up. It just scrolled it down and back around. If I want to reactivate scrolling again so we can see what that looks like, let me go ahead and hit escape and L and I'm going to hit escape and I. I for insert because I need a fresh line and I'm going to type DIR again. Now watch what happens. And you'll notice that it's scrolling again. So that's how you can turn your scroll on and off. Okay, this next one is extremely handy for basic programmers. How many of you have run into this situation where you type 10 and you type print, you do an exclamation point and you say retro uh, garbage and that's not really what you meant and then you do this and you hit enter and you come back up here and you want to insert some characters here and then you want to move your, and then you can't insert characters because and you can't move because of that and that happens well if you hit escape and zero that will get rid of that quote mode so you're no longer stuck in quote mode i wish i had known that a long time ago all right let me get some more text on the screen for these next couple of escape codes we're going to come up here i am going to move here to revolution the beginning of revolution i'm going to hit escape and p and you'll notice that it erases everything prior to that cursor on that line. If you want the opposite of that to occur, hit escape and Q, and it erases everything past the cursor. Earlier we used a control code to switch to the VIC-4 color ranges 16 through 31. You can also do that with an escape and an S, and you'll see the cursor changes to indicate that you're now in that extended color range. You can switch back to the original color palette by hitting escape and U and you'll notice the cursor character color changes to make that indication. Okay, we jumped ahead a little bit in our alphanumeric keys. We need to come back to escape T. Let me go ahead and restore the screen, and I'm going to move the cursor to right about here, and I'm going to hit escape and T, and then I'm gonna type directory. And you'll notice what I've done is I've moved the top left screen margin over 
to where the cursor was. Go ahead and hit Run Stop Restore to bring us back to our normal margins. Escape V scrolls the screen up. Escape W scrolls the screen down. Now we'll need some characters on the screen to see that. Escape V and Escape W. Now notice that it doesn't pull what has already been scrolled off the screen. It doesn't remember that. We've had several ways we can switch between 40 and 80 column mode. There's also an escape function for that. Let's go ahead and hit Escape and X. Type our directory. And there you go. Escape and X again will change back to 80. Now remember, it's not swapping and saving the contents of the screen. It will delete the contents of the screen and swap between 40 and 80 column mode. How do you restore your tab stops to the default eight spaces? A simple escape and Y will restore every eight spaces. So if I hit tab, you'll see every eight spaces is a tab stop. Now what's handy is escape Z gets rid of all of our tab stops. So again, going back to escape Y, that will put them back in place for us. Pretty handy. Now these next two escape codes, I'm a real fan of. I'm not sure how I'm going to use them, but I'm just a fan. Let's take a look. All right, the last two escape codes are going to make use of those funny little arrow characters that are not cursor keys. So we're going to go ahead and move our cursor to the end of this line right here, or that particular position. I'm going to hit escape, and I'm going to hit the up arrow all right, and then I'm just going to move the cursor around and let's say I'm down here and I've moved around here. I'm over here and I don't know. And, you know, I thought I remembered moving up to a specific spot uh, on the screen. And you see I've scrolled, so uh, that's kind of weird. Uh, but if I hit escape and this back arrow character, watch what happens. It jumps right back to that exact point on the screen that I saved. So it's a way to use those two characters to save and jump back to a position on the screen. Now, not a position connected to text, a position on the screen. If you have examples of where that's gonna be handy, you know what to do, comments down below. Hey, I lied to you. I said we were going to talk about function keys and escape codes and we were going to be done. But along the way, while creating my script, I found this other really cool feature of the Mega 65 keyboard that I want to demonstrate to you now. Okay, so we've got a fresh Mega 65 screen. And as you explore your Mega 65, one of the things you're going to be doing is you're going to be installing cores on your Mega 65. What if I told you you could boot directly to those cores without going to the cores menu? All right, let's see if this works. We're gonna hold the no scroll. Remember that one? We've talked about the no scroll. Well, there's another little feature of just not scrolling. Let's hold the no scroll. We're gonna press one and we're going to reboot the machine. Okay, and as expected, it should load the first core, right? That's what we've done. That's core number one. Let's try core number two. No scroll, two, power off, power on, let up on the keys. And we're in Commodore 64 mode, which is my second core. Let's verify that. And there you can see the cores that I have. Now, if we want to run that test core, number seven, let's go ahead and turn it off. Let's hold no scroll, seven, turn it on, let up on the keys. And that's actually right because that core isn't working. So let's go back to our C64 core. Turn it off, no scroll, two, turn it on, let it up. And there we go. So there's how you can quickly boot between your various cores. So when you have the Game Boy core and you have the ZX Spectrum core and you have that fancy new Commodore 128 and Commodore Plus 4 core that's coming years from now, you'll be able to jump through those really quickly by using that keyboard combination. 
Okay, that is all of the keyboard keystrokes you need to become a Mega 65 Master. Did I miss something? Is something not explained the way it needs to be? You know what to do. Leave a comment down below and I will address it. If I need to make a correction, I will put that in the video errata on the companion blog post. Hopefully you found value in this video and you are on your way to becoming a Mega 65 Keyboard Master. If you did, make sure you hit that little thanks button down below. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all those other things you need to do. And once again, let me remind you that you can support the channel at buymeacoffee.com slash retrocombs. Okay, there's a lot more on the companion blog post, so as soon as this video is open, check out that link in the video description below and have a new way to sign off of my videos. One of the things that we've been talking about in the Discord channel is the Commodore One Finger Salute. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you. In a world of fun and fantasy and ever-changing views and computer terminology Commodore is news. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping Retrocombs out.